Hello and welcome back to Spy Hard's podcast and our extended coverage of the 60th anniversary of James Bond. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur, saluting Congress for their accident prevention efforts. (laughs) You're really proud of that one, aren't you? I'm so proud. I was beaming when I was writing that one down. (laughs) I I, I dare not even think about the outro at this point. (laughs) There's some options. (laughs) There are some options. There are some options. But uh, Cam, I have a question for you. Yes. Are you ready to climax? Um, I can't say that happened during the uh, watching of uh, today's film slash TV special. <laughs> slash something. Yeah, slash something. Mm-hmm. Live broadcast, yeah. Y- yeah, felt like it, didn't it? Well, it was. okay. Was it live? It was, yeah, film live. I didn't know that. We'll put a pin yeah. in that because that makes sense about one particular thing I had a note about. Okay. For those who haven't read the title on the episode and have just clicked listen because you rock what are we talking about this week we are tackling the 1954 adaptation of casino royale which premiered on the tv show climax it was the third episode and it aired on october 21st 1954 yeah this is the first ever appearance of james bond i guess outside of novels that's correct yeah yeah pretty big moment for the character often forgotten about i would say yeah um it's one that pops up as more of a curiosity i remember back in the day i bought a dvd of it on ebay in the early days of you know ebay when you would get all these sorts of cool things that's when i got like the fantastic four bootleg of that Mm. 1994 roger corman movie the star wars holiday special and i bought casino royale and i was so excited to watch it and then the dvd was defective and i was not able to watch it (laughs) Are you sure it wasn't just the actual thing and it was uh, spot on? I wish. It wouldn't even play. Nothing happened when you put it in the player. <laughs> it may have saved you. <laughs> so it had actually been like, I-, I just never watched it on YouTube. So this was the first time I'd ever watched it was for this special. Yeah, well, uh, same here. But uh, for those who um, yeah, have never heard of Casino Royale, strangely, uh, mm. here is your letterbox.com synopsis. And uh, it's a short one. There's no tent pitching this week. Casino Royale. American spy James Bond must outsmart card whiz and crime boss Le Chiffre while monitoring his actions. Bang on. Bang on. Short and to the punch, much like the episode. That is is 100% accurate, yes. Um, Well, I mean... I was aware of it, much like you were. Obviously, you made uh, overtures to try and get a copy in the early noughties, which I, I appreciate you doing that. I, I was always just aware of it as like this um, thing to dismiss, much like Casino Royale 67, much like Never Say Never Again. It's just one of those outliers that people just don't really count in the uh, oeuvre. Before you say that word, does that, does that count? Sure, yeah. Is it an oeuvre of Bond? Uh, it sounds really posh. I'm not really quite sure what it means. But the the canon of Bond. But it, it's very much like uh, Raymond said earlier last week in our Casino Royale 2006 review. It's important to watch these things to see where Bond has come from. The roots of Bond in live action. Mm-hmm. Definitely, yeah. Uh, but I, I think before we talk about what we thought of this curio, as you put it, um, do you have any backstory on how it came to pass? So a little bit. Um, the Climax TV series um, ran for four seasons. It produced 166 episodes. And it was essentially like a you know, filmed live um, sort of mystery-themed series. And as I said, Casino Royale was episode three. And how did this happen? It was not that interesting, really. I mean, Ian Fleming had obviously been interested in adapting James Bond for Hollywood. And, you know, there'd been the film, you know, issues where he was working on that script with Kevin McClory on the James Bond of the Secret Service script and what have you. Um, But CBS approached him and was like, hey, we'll give you $1,000 for the rights to Casino Royale. And he was like, sold. (laughs) How did that conversation go? Hey, Mr. Fleming, would you like to climax? (laughs) He was like, would I? (laughs) Oh, sign me up, kid. Yeah. So, like... That was kind of 
what started the t- trajectory for the very complicated Casino Royale rights issues that would then <laughs> complicate matters for decades to come. But it was just that, yeah, $1,000 offer from CBS. Why was that the, the sort of problem? I thought the problem was more the McClory estate with Casino Royale. Or was it actually from this that, that caused all the problems? Yeah, no, Kevin McClory really doesn't have anything to do with Casino Royale rights. He just has to do with the Thunderball rights and Spectre being introduced in the Thunderball script that they created. Um, The Casino Royale rights, you know, basically changed hands, but CBS had them. And then they wound up being picked up to do the um, 1967 film when the rights became available. And that's why Casino Royale was separated from the larger Bond rights package for so long and ultimately why it was not until 2006 before they were able to do a proper adaptation. Because I'm sure, had they had the rights, you would have had a Casino Royale film way back. Probably maybe Connery era, maybe early Roger Moore era, somewhere in there. Yeah, for sure. It, it's it's one of the better stories from what I, I've seen of Bond. So, uh, absolutely. Um, it's a shame that it was locked up in this then, because if he only sold it for that amount of money, and I don't know what that money equates to now, it feels like quite a low ball offer for when you look at what Bond is doing, even in the 60s, let alone now. Yeah, but it is a few years before um, the Ian Fleming novels have really taken off in a big way, because that happened when you know JFK really recommended From Russia With Love in like an article, and that's when suddenly James Bond became much more popular in the launch of the movies. At this era, mm, kind of makes sense. Um, so that was kind of the issue. In terms of like behind-the-scenes stuff... Um, It was directed by William H. Brown, who really didn't have a big career. He was a um, director-producer. He only did, like, I think five directorial efforts and three producer efforts. And he mostly just shot these, like, live TV specials that would air on these kind of anthology TV shows. He worked on things like Schlitz, Playhouse of the Stars, Studio One, shows like that. And then this episode, of course, of Climax. But the writing is actually more interesting. So, on one hand, you have Anthony Ellis. Um, This was near the start of his career. Mostly just a TV guy. Did a ton of TV episodes, including an episode of Man from U.N.C.L.E., so he has some spy cred. But, you know, not like a career that really leaps off the page. The other writer, however, was Charles Bennett. And we've covered Charles Bennett before. He worked with Hitchcock quite closely back in the day. He wrote uh, The Man Who Knew Too Much. 39 Steps, he adapted that one. He did Secret Agent, Foreign Correspondent, and a couple other Hitchcocks around that time period. So, like, this was a pretty big name um, working at adapting this story for TV. It it feels strange. I mean, do you have any information about Climax itself? I know it's weird saying that out loud. I'm very sorry, everyone. Uh, (laughs) Cam, can you tell me about Climax? I mean, what do you want to know, I suppose, is the question. <laughs> this, this is the million-dollar question, everyone. What do you want to know? Um, well, was it a popular show? Like, I'm not asking for ratings, because I imagine it's very hard to track. But yeah, it feels like there's a bit of money behind this. And if they're getting in that writer who worked with Hitchcock to give him some of his most famous films, they had some sway. I mean, if it ran 166 episodes, it must have been somewhat popular, I would have to think. Um, I don't think it has like the prestige of some of the ones we know now by name, like Alfred Hitchcock Presents or um, Twilight Zone. Like those are, you know, shows that really had a long legacy, but it was incredibly common to have these sorts of shows in that era where it was these kind of hour long dramas, often an anthology feel, and there was just a ton of them. I think the thing with Climax was it was probably as popular as a lot of the others of the time. It just doesn't have the longevity in us knowing what it is but probably not like a number one ratings darling but probably successful it also suffers and this is a more of a modern issue for being almost completely ungoogleable mm-hmm. much like the triple x films if you google climax sure you're gonna get some problems you better get those <laughs> uh, adult filters off folks yeah but like you know i mentioned the uh director worked on like playhouse of the stars and studio one like those were reasonably successful shows as well have you ever heard of those i haven't (laughs) no that's that's fair that's fair i have not yeah and really just uh notably barry nelson um an actor who just one of those utility players of the era he'd gotten his start in stuff like shadow of the thin man 
um, which is a good movie, as well as A Guy Named Joe, which was re- uh, later remade as Always by Steven Spielberg. But he's probably best known to people from The Shining. He plays the guy who's interviewing Jack Nicholson for the job at the start of that film, and he's quite memorable in that movie. He was also in Airport, a movie that I know you watched fairly recently. He was in Airport. I have to go find what he did in Airport. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. And uh, so, like, there was some pedigree to this thing. And it is also notable, just as a postscript, that uh, in 1958, CBS did approach Ian Fleming about turning James Bond into a uh, TV show. And it just kind of went nowhere. I'm sure Fleming worked on a few little ideas and whatever, but it just never amounted to anything. As in, like, more of a recurring story each week type thing? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it certainly has the legs for it, if you wanted to do that. But oh, definitely. But I, th- I, I think where we ended up was probably the the better version, because, hey, we're talking about it 60 years later. That's right. What a way to uh, celebrate that anniversary. Yeah, with Barry Nelson. <laughs> the originator. The OG. <laughs> you couldn't be more spy hard than talking about Barry Nelson. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. <laughs> Did you figure out who he was in airport? No, I, I tried. To, I, I saw the photo of him in The Shining. I recognized him instantaneously. He, yeah. he didn't age as well as some of the other Bonds, I have to say. Like, if, if I saw him 15, 20 years later, I'd be like, mm, that's very much more a Never Never Again than a, a Daniel Craig at that age. That is very true, yes. Uh, no, I will find the airport thing afterwards. It hasn't jumped out to me yet. But uh, do you have any more behind the scenes for us? No, that's really about it. There's only so much in a anthology TV show of this era to really mention. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair enough. They cranked them out like crazy, right? Like it was just a conveyor belt of uh, hour-long programs. Well, it's live, exactly. So, sure, like it, it, it. I guess you rehearsed it for a day or two, and then shot it, and you're on to the next one. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Perfect. Really. Um, we don't. I suppose we get a lot of live TV these days, but not like live dramatizations. That's more for stage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you do get. Oh boy, I think it was like a. I'm trying to think of how long ago this was. It was quite a while, but I remember George Clooney starred in, I think, produced a live um, TV adaptation of Failsafe, um, which was a um, sort of suspense political thriller, um, the original from the 60s. Um, But it's not too often. I think more generally of they do musicals live, like Grease Live and things like that as big, you know, TV events. Yeah, uh, well, that that makes sense. M- musicals, because the, people do them on stage, it makes perfect sense. But yeah, the, I think it's harder to control drama. And plus, people have such high expectations of drama now. There's like special effects, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I mean, look at Casino Royale. Even Casino Royale 67 has more effects going for it than this does. Yes, just just a little bit, though. Just, just a little. Just a, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Well, let's uh, let's not dilly dally around. Let's uh, get right to the back of a table and talk about Casino Royale, nineteen fifty four, completing the trio for us of two thousand six and sixty seven. We've done all three now. Hopefully, they'll do a new Casino Royale in the future, so we can add a fourth to make it a quad quadrilogy. Quadrilogy. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm picking up words today. I'm trying to sound eloquent. It's not coming off well. But um, I think I'll take us off. I'll start us on this one, Cam. Yes. I wrote down, and I'm I'm proud of this. <laughs> Casino, as in Z Z Z Z Z Royale. <laughs> if that doesn't spell out what I think about this, yeah, I don't know what does. But I, boy, I didn't know it was life. Which I one of my criticisms, and I can talk about it later, is people just seemed off. Mm. Like Peter Lorre in one scene was basically just talking. There was no acting going on. He was just saying his lines like a conversation, which is fine if you're not invested in the work. But if it's like this is being cranked out, they have one day to rehearse, I could perfectly understand where he didn't have a grasp on the character and he's just sort of going through the motions. But like, I there's a whole scene. If you, if you haven't watched this and you're listening to the episode, there's a whole scene, I think about 15 minutes, of the Baccarat game from Casino Royale. But that's literally all that's going on is the Baccarat game. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, Cam doesn't understand Baccarat. That's true. So I can't imagine you were following it particularly well. Well, I actually understand the rules 
decently enough because if you read the book, they explain it very well. Okay, because there is and there is a moment where they sort of briefly explain the rules as part of a, a spy conversation, but they actually don't tell you really anything about the rules. No, they they basically just say, "What is it like? You either win or you lose." I'm like, yeah. "Well, fair enough." Well, <laughs> yep, it's, it's not wrong. He's not wrong. <laughs> um, but like it, it's it's well, you think about Casino Royale 2006, for instance. You you have they're obviously playing poker, but you have Mathis telling Vesper what's going on in the game because she doesn't understand. So she she's like our conduit through to the game so we can understand who's winning and losing. This doesn't suffer fools. So hmm. if you don't know your Baccarat, you can get the F out of this. Because it you were just confused. I was confused, I have to say. I didn't know who was winning apart from the fact that someone had a smile and someone had a frown at the end of each hand. I was wondering, perhaps do you think in like 1954, people had a far better comprehension of Baccarat than they do now? Is it a game that was like far more popular then? Sweevy. <laughs> Cause I was wondering that because it's like it seemed like it was very much taking for granted that the audience would know exactly how this operates. Logically, I would say card games are more prevalent because people didn't have TVs or or, or had less TVs or didn't have smartphones or anything like that. Wait, how were they watching Climax? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure anyone did, Cam. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I just don't think that there was other distractions so people would play things like, uh, you know, poker in their house and stuff and, you know, um, solitaire and they'd know game, card games. I know a lot of these just from being on caravan holidays here in the UK where you didn't have a television. All you could do was sit in a, in a r- rainy caravan because you can't go outside. You have to play card games. I learned a lot of those. But even like younger generations from me, making me sound old, probably don't know a lot of those games so maybe people did know the rules of baccarat and this was riveting television but for me watching a black and white copy on well, it, was, it was filmed black and white i should say on youtube that was very grainy i was baffled at the choice to do that it was not what you would call drama <laughs> it's the sort of thing i remember when we talked about the 2006 movie martin campbell had said behind the scenes that, like his biggest terror in making that movie was working with the card scenes because he was not someone who was well versed in poker and he you know was going and watching all of these gambling movies to try to figure out how to shoot it to make it compelling and i remember thinking at the time like maybe he was overthinking it because like he really delivers and then i watched this and i go it's a good thing he was overthinking it because we could have had something like this <laughs> that's my favorite part i think of the whole movie is like literally the baccarat game which Okay, in the 2006 movie, it's like this build-up. It's he has to win this Texas hold uh, this Texas Hold'em tournament, and I mean, it's Bond like they're arcing it, where it's like the suspense of losing all his money, having to get Felix Leiter's money, and like it's just done so well dramatically. And in this one, it's like lose, lose, lose. You're out of money. <laughs> I'm like, wow. <laughs> So that was fast. It literally like Bond taps out in like two minutes. <laughs> I, I well, it felt like it lasted a lot longer than that. I have to say that's where that's where the Zeds came from. He didn't win a single hand. They couldn't give him one. They're just like <laughs> lose, lose, lose. You're out. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Sweevy, Sweevy, man. <laughs> and I'm like, is he good at baccarat? Because like they really get across that like you know the bond of the 2006 movie is really good at poker like that's why mm-hmm. you enter him in the tournament in this case i was really wondering if was it the cia who did he work for i i well it was the us so i guess it was the cia yeah so i was really wondering if the U, if the uh, us had very poor baccarat players and bond was just like the best they had <laughs> uh, it, it genuinely makes sense i mean i i was i was baffled by that but like you think about casino royale 2006 after every hand, they found a reason. Or it wasn't every hand, but like every sort of section of hands. But really, you only ever focus on one. They'd find a reason to leave the table. Mm. It would be like to talk about getting a drink or it'd be Bond getting poisoned or the fight in the hotel room or running out of money. This is just a continuous card game. But then this book ended on either side by, I guess, action sequences. Yeah. Or what passes as action sequences in this story. It starts off really well. Like Bond is getting shot at. Like, that's by a guy with very poor aim. <laughs> very poor aim. Like he's hiding behind a very thin tree, 
and he's managing to miss Bond. But is it the guy with the cane, by the way? Is it cane guy? I don't know. They don't really establish it. Um, it could be because that's the only real guy we see showing up with that type of gun later on. That makes sense. Yeah, maybe. Uh, people do have other guns. Although it does introduce like one of the great Bond moments where like he's shot at and then he's like, eh, he got away anyway. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> it's like, he takes two steps. He's like, ah, no, no, no. I can't be bothered. I'm too tired. <laughs> I've got to play Baccarat. Yeah, I was reminded watching this of, um, do you remember that episode of The Simpsons? I think it was called like the 138th episode extravaganza where it's um, Troy McGlure going through the history of The Simpsons. And there's the part where they show the old Tracy Ullman cartoons and they look so archaic. Yep. And it cuts back to Troy McGlure. He's like, ha 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 ha. They haven't changed a bit. <laughs> That's how I felt watching this. I felt like it was so archaic that it was like, wow, how incredibly far we've come. But like, ironically, it's like, oh, of course, this is the classic Bond I know and love. So like for me, like the entertainment came from knowing where the franchise is going and kind of doing the reverse engineering to see how Hollywood slowly adapted into into what we know. And like, mm -hmm. there's elements, like there's some quips. It has kind of that upper class kind of style to it. But just the creakiness of it, the um, shifting of Bond to an American agent, as they refer to him as Card Sense Jimmy Bond, <laughs> the classic nickname that would really carry through over the course of the Eon legacy. Um, and then also Clarence Leiter making Felix British. And casting an actor who looks far more like James Bond than uh, Barry uh, than Barry Nelson, I thought that was interesting. But like, yeah, I, I agree. Like, this is like, this is a curio. It's very creaky. It's very awkward, but it's kind of interesting. Sure. Just because I think we know that, yeah, we know the Casino Royale story so well that to watch it run through this filter where they're making all sorts of bizarre changes, I was like, eh, kind of interesting. So I wasn't bored, but I, I. Would not say this works as compelling drama at all. <laughs> I, it doesn't. I suppose it doesn't help that like I'm coming off of a very busy like Bond weekend or the Bond mm -hmm. 60th anniversary, so I, I was a little bit tired, and I thought 50 minutes. This is perfect. And I was around the backer table. I was getting a bit drowsy. I have to admit, I had to really like. I had to do the, the U and start like stand up to watch it for a little bit just to get myself back in the game. Mm. But. It's it's interesting because people talk about um, Never Say Never Again. And they talk about Casino Royale 67, about having Bond without the trappings. And does that make it not Bond? This is Bond with no trappings whatsoever. Never Say Never Again has trappings. Some things, the gun barrel, Bond, James Bond, has a martini, I think, at one point. But and same with Casino Royale. This has nothing. And I literally, I think I wrote... If you take everything away, he's just a bloke in a tuxedo that's good at cards. Yeah. Well, he wasn't that good at cards. <laughs> well, he wasn't that good at cards. Um, it's interesting seeing it from that angle. That I, I actually almost appreciate Casino Royale 67 and Never Say Never Again a bit more because of this. Which is unfair. Um, it's unfair on Casino Royale 54. Like it, 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 it was never aiming to be any of this. It never had any of the pressure of it being a... A, you know, Eon production or whatever it was known as in the 60s. But I guess I'm so used to that. Coming back to this is, is quite the whiplash. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a big Batman fan. And if you go back and watch like old serials of Batman and things like that, it's like they get it close enough that it's recognizable to you as Batman. Like in those eras, they would never use... The classic villains, they always just created their own villains. I could never figure out why. Usually the villains were gangsters and things like that. Or, you know, enemy spies or something. But, like, when you kind of squint, you go, oh, that that is Batman. I recognize it as Batman. And I'm sure the costume makes a certain amount of, uh, you know, effort in kind of merging those two things. But, like, when I watch this, it never feels like Bond. And I'm not even just saying, like, an Eon movie, but, like, you know, I've read the Ian Fleming novel Casino Royale and several other novels, not all of them, but several, and it doesn't really even capture the spirit of his writing. Um, it's definitely a, you know, American adaptation, although mm -hmm. I think Charles Bennett, I think it's British, but nonetheless, like it's an American TV adaptation that it's like, you know, we're saying you kind of have to squint to see it and it becomes more interesting to see how 
these kind of early stages of adapting Bond happened. It's, it, but it feels like, unlike Batman, it's not quite as recognizably the character as what we would get going forward. Well, it, it's also interesting in the sense of this is this version is clearly what people at CBS thought was the interesting part of Casino Royale. Um, this sort of man of mystery and, and the card game, really, and, and overcoming a bad guy. Uh, I've not read Casino Royale, so I can't really comment. But I, I would assume there's a bit more to him than that, because that's why it's it, it spawned sequels. Yeah, like Ian Fleming had a very distinct um, concept as to who James Bond was. That's not really here. I mean, this is kind of the all-American agent. Um, you know, Barry Nelson does not project uh, danger. He's very, you know, approachable looking. Um, and this is also 1950s, where 1950s U.S. cinema, like, I, they hadn't really nailed down kind of the notion of, like, spy storytelling. You know, you had Hitchcock British films in the 40s, um, and Hitchcock would cross over and make, like, foreign correspondent in the U.S., but, like, outside of Hitchcock, was there... Because we've covered several things, and it I feel like most of the um, 30s, 40s stuff we tackle is British. Not always. Not always. And some but... of the 50s stuff is American. That's true. The, but that's, I think, Hitchcock so far. Yeah, and like when I think of the 50s stuff we've talked about, it was like Springfield Rifle, where it's like westerns and things like well, that. Well, nailed. Perfect. Yeah. It's like the yeah. best thing ever. Mm. Um. The other thing, I, I, it's interesting you made the Batman comparison, because in my notes I made a, a comparison to the original series of Star Trek. And it's almost as if like you're reading um, Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek's like, original pitch, and they, they, they've like done like a demo reel to see what it would look like to sell it to CBS, funnily enough. Mm-hmm. Um, but instead of having like the Starship Enterprise in a beautiful model shot and then like people in great costumes, they've got like SNL characters with, with, with glued on pointy ears and then a, cut, a cardboard cut out of the Enterprise and someone going pew pew wow and, yeah. like, a, and like a fake star field for effects. It, it is very much a budget production. I don't really begrudge it that. No. But I feel like they've not nailed down what it is that's interesting about the character. So really is for anyone coming into it, unless you've read Casino Royale in 1954, you this this guy is just a guy who, who kind of overcomes the bad guy. It really is nothing else to it. There's nothing to read into the character. To me, I think the most compelling aspect of the entire hour is Peter Lorre as Le Chiffre, which to me, like, you know, when I'm comparing him to like Mads Mikkelsen, Mads Mikkelsen is getting way more material to work with, like way more. Um, So it's not fair to compare them. But I thought like Peter Lorre, who we've covered in several movies now on this show and will cover in several more in the future, he just brings just naturally a charisma and menace that I think really works for this villain. I would love to have seen him do a full-on movie version. I think he could have been fantastic as opposed to, you know, an hour-long drama that's filmed live. So you only get so much, as you said, there's lines where it just feels like he's just kind of talking. But like he just projects so much that to me... That's what carries me through far more than Barry Nelson as James Bond. Yeah, the the stuff where Laurie's actually working for me is in that last sequence in the hotel room. Yeah, that's where he's like got the menace. And there's actually something physical about Peter Laurie's performance in this. He's, he seems, despite being quite a short chap, from what I can tell, at least on on this, he 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 just has like a, a frame to him that looks like he's going to beat the living daylights out of you. If you pardon the Bond pun. Hmm. Um. And so that that really worked for me, like a menace. It actually reminded me more of the Casino Royale sixty seven version of Le Chiffre, where like he's, he's towering, but without the magic tricks, <laughs> without the levitation, folks. I I I I I don't want to disappoint you when you go and watch this afterwards. There's no levitation. There's no uh, flags of the world. Yeah, <laughs> around the background, and there's no uh, Jacqueline Bisset. No, that's true. I do um, feel a little sorry for Peter Laurie though, in that there's like several lines where they're like. Well, they refer to Le Chiffre as a toad-like creature. And uh, someone says, you're an ugly little man. Why don't you stop talking? And I'm like, poor Peter Laurie. Poor Peter Laurie. <laughs> I mean, we, we both had those insults thrown at us before, to be fair. <laughs> it's just like, oh, I mean, like this Peter Laurie had so much presence because of his physicality and just how he looked. But like, you feel a little bad when characters are just like, isn't he hideous? Isn't he disgusting? <laughs> Well, let's um let's talk about Barry Nelson. Yeah, 
the first ever on-screen depiction of James Bond. Although he he gets Jimmy Bond a couple of times, but he also gets James. So I guess it's Jimmy was a nickname, not a given name. It's a very Americanized thing to say. So sure. Yeah. Um, he looks like the kind of guy you take back to meet your parents. Yeah. He does not look like a grizzled veteran of the spy world that you know kind of hates the doesn't hate the establishment but like he's sullied by it all and he's been hurt before and weathered he does get mad at valerie mathis for not writing to him so well i'm also (laughs) mad at her for not writing to me but that's beside the point (laughs) yeah like you don't get a lot of because when i think of bond there's various interpretations but there's a there's a coolness to that character that really doesn't come across in this adaptation. And I don't blame Barry Nelson 100%. I'm sure that the way they're writing him is not uh, really living up to the bond we all know and love. But like, there's parts where he just seems pretty flappable as opposed to unflappable. Like, I think of the scene where he's in the bathtub and like Valerie says something. He's like, Valerie, shut up! <laughs> <laughs> Is that when he's like beaten down at the end? Like he's just given up on everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you get some of the more Bondian brutality at the end when he like shoots Le Chiffre. Um So I-, I liked when you got elements like that kind of working their way and that reminded me more of the uh, the literary Bond. But there's not a lot. And also, which version did you see? How did it end? Uh, it ended with like the narrator at the, at the end. Okay, yeah, because originally, I guess, the version that existed for a lot of people, including there was a DVD release um, that hacked, they they just didn't have the ending. They couldn't find oh. it. And so it ended basically after he'd, I think, shot Le Chiffre the first time, mm-hmm. and he leaves the bathroom, and he basically says, call the police, and it cut off there. Oh. And then they found the footage later, and put it back together which is why if you watch it on youtube and there's a link in the show notes for people that want to do that the last like three minutes looks like garbage <laughs> like I it looks notice that that drop in quality right okay so it's like a lost reel they found basically exactly yeah so okay. then you okay. get the whole stuff with the you know pulling the razor blade out of his hat and holding valerie and bond shooting him so like that kind of has that deadly aspect of Bond, but for a lot of people, you know, who maybe watched the uh, DVD that had come out years past, they wouldn't have seen that aspect. He does also get the first ever Bond one-liner that I made a note of. Oh, was that the uh, "I'm the fella who was missed"? Yeah. So the um, basically, we mentioned the Bond gets shot at at the start. He then goes into the casino and schmoozes a little bit, and uh, one of the uh, I think it's actually it's Clarence Lighter. Uh, the the Felix Leiter version of this, although he's actually a Brit, which is a, an interesting twist. They've swapped him round. Uh, walks up to Bond and says, uh, "Aren't you the fellow who was shot?" And then Bond replies, "No, I'm the fellow who was missed." Yeah, that's pretty good, actually. Da, 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 da. Like that's not bad. That's not bad at all. That's not bad. That's not bad. They they clearly got some. I, mean, I don't know whether the Bond books are full of those sorts of puns. I don't remember Doctor No being full of it. Not really. No, There's no. not a lot. It's more like a cinematic invention. The whole, like, Bond quip. I mean, there's the odd line throughout the Fleming books, for sure. Like, he's a good dialogue writer, but, like, uh, the real Bond quips come more from the movies. That makes sense. So, yeah, it was the first time we ever saw that. I Overall, he was fine, but he never jumped off the screen for me. Like, I, 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 I would take, and this is honestly true, I would take Peter Sellers over Barry Nelson. Same here. Um, I just don't think an American Bond really works. And I'm sure I'll be proven wrong, perhaps, at some point in my lifetime where some actor will come in who's... I I don't know. Like, I was going to... I was even hedging that when I said it because it's like, I know they almost hired James Brolin back in the day. And then they looked at, um, you know, I think Adam West tested for it. Burt Reynolds was tested. So it's like they have considered it in the past. Uh, And to this day, they say that... uh, um, James Brolin just like knocked it out of the park so like who knows well, he was cast wasn't he very briefly and then yeah and then Roger Moore came back exactly yeah but uh, who knows like there could be an actor that could change my mind at some day in the future if it ever happens but like Barry Nelson is not the one to change my mind the whole time I was looking at Clarence Leiter being like this actor should be playing the Bond role like he mm-hmm. has the look um, he has that kind of dark mystery about him um, 
I would happily watch this guy play Bond. Well, I suppose I don't feel like I've got enough out of him to really to really agree to you on that one. Uh, my my lighter experience was maybe not as good as yours, but well, he... I mean, I'm not going to say he's great, but if you ask me which one feels more like Bond in this 1954 live TV special, I'm going to say the guy who played Clarence Leiter. Those are my only two options. <laughs> sure, I, I'm going to go for Peter Lorre. Oh, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, he, he's very much he's close to one of the Bonds in Casino Royale 67, at least. Anyway, that is accurate. Yeah, yeah. The Seal. Of course, <laughs> the seal. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to make uh, other characters I thought m- worth mentioning is Vesper. Yeah, it's not uh, Vesper though. I I know I'm getting to it. Yeah, because ve- the the Vesper character is kind of an amalgam of a character that's not in either of the full live act adaptations. I think it, the Mathis, but is because Mathis is a, a character in 2006 film. Is Mathis a woman in in the Casino Royale book, or is there two Mathis? see uh no well they combined like the mathis character with vesper for this special oh so they combined a man and a woman basically. yeah i, I guess see. so yeah i guess that's yeah. what they're doing well they combined two characters so the sex is fairly unimportant but okay yeah, yeah so you've got valerie mathis uh as a, a made-up name i i mean she was there's meant to be this like a love story in the background between her and Bond, which I didn't really buy into. They really sort of try and sell that to you pretty early on, and it comes back around at the end where he's, like, shouting at her in the bathtub and, like, didn't didn't write to me, as you mentioned. Uh, she was just there for me, I have to say. Yeah, I looked up the actress after it was over, Linda Christian, because I was like, oh, this was not the most charismatic, dynamic performance. Um, and the only thing I've seen her in was Tarzan and the Mermaids, which was, like, I think the 12th of the Johnny Weissmuller Tarzan movies. I went and did a whole run of those back in the day. And it was like the worst one. So I do not remember her in that whatsoever. She didn't have like a huge career. Um, It's kind of a thankless role. And I think it is because of the fact we're saying like it's not quite Mathis. It's not Vesper. Because like Vesper has a very interesting story throughout the course of the original novel that has obviously been expanded you know, in the more recent film version we talked about. But, like, what really is Valerie Mathis? She's too watery a character because she doesn't have kind of the agent smarts of the Mathis character, that kind of insider's look at the world. She also doesn't have the tragic story of Vesper. So what does she have? Like, the whole aspect of her being an agent is... I mean, it doesn't really factor into the story whatsoever. The way they tell it, it's a reveal. But, like... She doesn't get to play any of the interesting aspects of either character, so I kind of can't fault her if the character is so thin on you know when you watch it on the uh, TV show. Sure, uh, that that's fair enough. I mean, the, one of the only questions I had sort of left from my review was actually just for both of us to maybe talk about. As as, as you said up the front, this is definitely a curio. Mm-hmm. What is like now? You've finally seen it in its entirety. Obviously, you've grown as a person leaps and bounds from doing so but or regress what it, oh or regress well we both yes so, yeah yeah we interrupt this program to bring you a special report calling all agents independent podcasting much like the spy game requires considerable resources whether it's research equipment hosting or of course constructing a top secret volcano lair We're putting out the call for your support. That's right. As you may know, we've activated the Spy Hearts Patreon, home of our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and full film commentaries with more intel than a Basil Exposition briefing. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? Scott, it's commentary time, so we're going to get inverted with Christopher Nolan's Tenet. And if that sounds delicious, then become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash spyhards. But before this message self-destructs, Cam, resume the spy jinx. What's like the, the moment you're going to remember from it looking back on it now? I think it's a combination of two things. I think 
One will be just the lose, lose, lose. <laughs> like, just that will stick with me. But maybe the torture scene of Bond in the bathtub with the, like, nutcracker on his toes? Maybe? It was so weird they chose... I, I know why they didn't go for the obvious, like, the paddle stuff. Yeah. Um, and I also will note Raymond Benson will be happy that there was Bakura in this version. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it's so weird they went for, like, pliers on his toes, but didn't really show them, like, grabbing his feet. You just had to assume it. I mean, that would have been, I'm sure, a 1950s TV sensor thing. They had to basically um, give the impression of torture taking place without showing anything. So I, I at first was like, what are they doing? I thought they were pliers and they were pulling his, like, um, toenails off. But yeah. I think it was just, like, using a nutcracker on his toes, like, breaking his toes. Okay. I mean, I could buy it. I'm sure it's very painful. Um, yeah. It I, it feels like it could be easily spoofed to like a man with like a feather at the end that's just tickling him. Come now, <laughs> Mr. Bond. Stop it! <laughs> Stop it! Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, like, that was... That kind of jumps out more. So it's kind of like, to me, they aren't really Bond moments, I guess. It's more like Peter Lorre torturing Bond and then Peter Lorre um, sitting at a card table, which just the the image of Peter Laurie sitting at a card table really sticks with me. Yeah, it, it, it certainly is a nice image. I, if I can answer my own question, I don't think I'll soon forget um, the very wide Barry Nelson hiding behind a very thin tree from <laughs> bullets. <laughs> that was like a like Looney Tunes cartoon. It really. I'm not saying Barry Nelson's a big lad. He's just actually just built quite big. He, he's got like a frame on him. I wouldn't be surprised if he played like football or something in college in America. Definitely got that sort of like all star look, like quarterback, that sort of thing. Handsome chap. But yeah, there's 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 like fake tree on the set that they're using, which is apparently was like a casino set on on the lot that they used. Very thin, and uh, whoever had the gun had very good accuracy, but very bad accuracy simultaneously, because he managed to knock the tree three times. Very yeah. close to each other, but not Bond once. It reminded me a little bit of, do you remember in True Lies, where Tom Arnold hides behind like a very thin pole, and the bullets mm. are all bouncing off the pole, and then he does like the feel around to see if he's been shot? It reminded me a little bit of that. It didn't remind me of that until right now, but now I can't unsee it. So that's a nice... Uh, so we're saying True Lies is riffing off of Casino Royale 1954. That's exactly what we're saying. James Cameron studied it just right down to the finest detail for uh, True Lies, yes. He always wanted to do a Bond film, but it turns out it was a Barry Nelson Bond film. That's right. That's right. Um, <laughs> I had a couple notes I will mention. We had a henchman with like the cane gun, which mm -hmm. the first Bond gadget we've ever gotten in the franchise, and also kind of like the first odd henchman type. Like the henchman with the gun cane is kind of noteworthy it does stand out a little bit and obviously we would get far more flamboyant things in the future with you know odd job and jaws and all that but kind of fun to see um did it jump out at you at all it did jump at me but i think for perhaps a reason either you've not clocked or you're just uh not talking about oh and what's that well the cane gun is a, a gadget used by one of our favorite spies on the show cam john steed condor man Oh, of course, Condor Man. That's right. John Steeds was a sword. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, Condor Man connections to Casino Royale 1954. A moment I was very chuffed to see. I'm glad the guy didn't roll around on the floor and then stand up and say, fastest gun in the West. <laughs> and my other question for you was, do you think that Lighter and Bond, on the basis of this one hour story, are good spies? I get the feeling lighter might be. I don't know. There's a lot of like, hey, did you notice this, this, and this? And they're basically just like having these like confidential talks right out in the middle of the casino. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you and I have been in many casinos, and I think you could talk very loudly and no one would pay any attention to you. That's true. The reality of uh, the real-life casino experience versus this very quiet set uh, or two different things. But we've been in many casinos where the uh, the average person is not wearing a dinner jacket. That is also true, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's Las Vegas for you folks, a much lower class of gambler. You're referring to us, obviously. Obviously. 
I mean, I was reminded watching Bond like lose and bomb out of that Baccarat game in like 30 seconds of us playing video poker um, towards the end of our Vegas trip. Sure. I, I, had, I did actually have one other note I wanted to bring up and, and sort of ask you about. Um, the casino police. Mm-hmm. Apparently, they're, they're going to help Bond at the start when he was shot at. I, I wonder who these casino police are and who gave them jurisdiction. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do these guys do? Do they police just the casino? Do they get the grounds around it? Do they uh, are they aided by the cops? It, it, it's a very murky affair. Yeah, because they would have Vegas or not Vegas, but like casino security. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Was this set in Monte Carlo? Where was this set? On a back lot in Hollywood. <laughs> That's true. Because <laughs> they were using francs. So I guess it was Monte Carlo? Yeah, that, I, I would imagine it was Monte Carlo just because that's, I guess that's the book. Um, I, I did also appreciate you just said Franks. Yeah, I know. As soon as I said that, I was like, that's not the right way, Franks. <laughs> I, I, I have, yeah, I, I've, I've used Franks in my life before it became the Euro, so I can say uh, I, I've handled that money. But um, yeah, the a concept of a casino police just baffles me a little bit. It, it really feels like uh, they wouldn't be on your side. Well, we will find out. <laughs> we get kicked out of a casino next time. <laughs> <laughs> we're the casino police and we're here to investigate you. We will find out when we do our uh, Spy Hards trip to Monte Carlo. Right. We just walk in just uh, with our cane, just shouting Sweevy. Exactly. <laughs> and then get thrown out by the casino police. Exactly. And arrested, <laughs> yes. Of course. Of course. I think, I picture when I think of like casino police, I think of that scene in the movie Casino involving a vice. And I'm like, I don't want to find out what happens when the casino police capture you. No, I'm not sure I'm up for that version of the casino police. I, I was thinking more like silly uniforms. Mm, mm, with okay. like truncheons and like, I don't know, big name badges. Right. Hi, I'm Officer Barr. Um, but yeah, I guess that was our chat about the Casino Police in Casino Royale 1954. <laughs> what a bizarre footnote in the in the realm of Bond this is. But I'm glad it got... Because I read that it was sort of lost for a long time. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad it was found. Because I think it's a shame to waste anything like this. Um, but I, I honestly don't think uh, the powers that be are looking back to this now as a sort of uh, a concept of what to do next with Bond. No, no. You have to learn to walk before you can run. And uh, this is the early steps, the earliest of steps. What? What? Uh, this isn't walking. This is this is crawling, surely. No, because I feel like a lot of people. I somewhat disagree, but would say like Doctor No is walking, and then when you get to like say Goldfinger or even From Russia with Love, that's when you're really off and running. Um, but this is the earliest of wobbly steps. This is Bambi on ice. <laughs> I I'm just picturing uh, Barry Nelson now just skidding on ice. Thank you for that. Being chased by the casino police. <laughs> exactly, exactly. With like Benny Hill music playing. Absolutely. Uh, better than the soundtrack of this, which was horrible. But that's beside the point. Was um, there a soundtrack? I didn't even think about that. There was a horrible like piano soundtrack in one scene where it's like script, like someone's just hitting the high notes like dee, 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 dee. Yeah, it really yeah. got in my ear. It was horrible. Um, okay. Well, I, it, it, this isn't going on the Noxless, folks. I mean, it's weird that we're even covering a TV show altogether. But it felt like we needed to talk about this film to complete the trifecta. I want to ask you, though, Cam, now that we've got here, rank the Casino Royales. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, this is, I think it just goes in a descending order of uh, recent to oldest. So I think it goes 2006 and then 67 and then this one. And you've obviously gone worst to best there, right? Um, correct, yes. Yeah. I, I don't think I can disagree with that listing. Uh, this is definitely the worst version of the story. Not necessarily in like it's a complete train wreck. I just think it's not very well told. I, I'm sure people watching it in 1954 were thoroughly entertained by the exploits of old Jimmy Bond. But yeah, I, I think they only learnt to improve on this recipe going forward. Although, you know, you might be able to make the argument it's a better adaptation than the 67 one. More coherent, maybe. I think you're, if you're a fan of the novel, you're going to appreciate this version more than the 67 one. I suppose in a sense, like it's a TV show. It's not aiming or has a budget to be a movie. So in that sense, you can forgive it. But like, look at what they do to the entire story of Casino Royale in the 67 one. They take like 
elements, but they don't really tell that story whatsoever. No, that, that's a fair point. Um, I hadn't really considered that, to be fair. I just, uh, I, I just didn't really get much out of this myself. At, le- at least with Casino Royale 67, I had some laughs, but I don't hold closely to the source material as much, so I'm not that fussed if they stray. Right. Um, I was just more fussed about uh, as an experience watching, and this was definitely the most frustrating out of the three. But Casino Royale 67 is not far off. Right, yeah. And 67 is also lacking a William Lundigan introducing the proceedings the way you have here. Of course. Although, would it have made more sense if he'd been there? It... <laughs> I would have loved if they brought him back holding up like the uh the card shoe and being like this is one of the deadliest things in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what would he be holding up in the 67 version? Oh my god. I'm racking my brain. Is it the script? That's probably the what script? <laughs> well, no, this is the most deadly thing known to man. It's the script of Casino Royale 1967. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know was there a finished script for 67? I, it's probably just a mountain of cocaine. That's what he's holding up. Or he's just... I don't think they did cocaine as much in the 60s, did they? Wasn't it something else? All right. Ecstasy or something? Sure. Yeah, yeah. You're, you were the one who lived for it, man. You're the expert. Sure. LSD. Um, I, He should just be holding up like one of those big like legal boxes that says <laughs> Casino Royale script. <laughs> <laughs> it's also got like a potted plant hanging out because you've been fired. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Well, there you go. This uh, was our coverage of Casino Royale 1954. We've done all three now. Tick, tick, tick. But this does not mean we are going to be taking on more TV shows in the future. I guess this has joined the two Harry Palmer TV movies now as our exceptions to the rules. But it has to be a big, big thing. And I think the first time Bond is on any type of screen is a big enough event for us to maybe bend those rules slightly. Yeah, I know people have requested we do the Born Identity TV movie. That's possible, maybe one day in the future, but um, we won't be doing a lot of these sorts of things unless there's like a real novelty to it. Kind of like when we talked as well, not in a separate episode, but within the first Dr. Goldfoot episode about that TV special. Yeah, or like we watched the first Man from Uncle when we covered the Man from Uncle. Yeah, and also Charlie's Angels. Absolutely, that was... Oof. Uh, I think I'd rather watch this than that Charlie's Angels episode, to be fair. That was a lot longer. I'm still wandering around that swamp. (laughs) Tommy Lee Jones is out there somewhere. (laughs) But that wraps up our James Bond coverage for the next couple of months. We'll be back with the next Craig film. I'm sure you figured out our pattern by now. But I want to thank you all for joining us for four episodes celebrating James Bond, celebrating Casino Royale, and celebrating 60 years of this favorite spy of ours on the big screen and on the little screen with this episode this week. It's been a lot of fun. I mean, personally, myself, I've been to all of the events happening in London over this Bond weekend. I went to the Constant Royal Abbott Hall. I am uh, full of Bond right now, so I'm looking forward to moving on to other pastures. So I guess the question goes to you, Cameron. What are we talking about next week? Well, we're not talking about Bond anymore, but we are talking about a Bond with uh, Timothy Dalton, we are going to tackle 1991's The Rocketeer, where Timothy Dalton played a villain. And uh, I think it was pretty incredible. And we're going to check back in with that movie that has, you know, a pretty big cult fandom built around it these days. Yeah, I'm very excited to finally watch this film. We've had it on our master list for a while, and it's been on my list personally as a film I've wanted to watch for a long time. So I've been waiting for this moment to finally tick it off. I, I know it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I, I've seen clips over the years that I've liked. And of course, it's got Timothy Dawson in it, which means it's obviously a tick from me. Plus, in addition to the review, we also have an interview with the film's co-writer, Mr. Danny Bilson. And he has some interesting Bond connections himself apart from this film. I'll leave the rest of the interview, but there's actually some very interesting stuff for you to check out. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch The Rocketeer and join us next week. If you like what you heard on the show, do consider leaving us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, tell your friends because we are the worst spies in the universe. We want everyone to know our name. And speaking of knowing our name, you can, of course, follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards. That's S P Y. H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners... Shut up, Scott! (laughs)